Welcome back to Lecture 6, Part 3, <clears throat> and we continue our lecture here today as we begin to look at number 8 of the sub-doctrine of the doctrine of God. Up until this particular point in time, we've looked at the deity of God, we've looked at the humanity of God, we've looked at the Son of God, we've looked at eternal generation, we looked at the I Am, we've looked at Lagos, okay? We get to number 8, the angel of the Lord, <clears throat> the angel of of the Lord. In your Bibles, in the book of Genesis chapter 16, we read in verse 7, Genesis 16, verse 7, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Now when we look at this in the Old Testament, because remember we're talking about Jesus, Christ, the Son of God. In the Old Testament, an angel identified as the angel of the Lord, we see that here in Genesis 16, 7, is the angel of God, okay? We see him as the angel of God later on in Genesis 21, verse 17. These are the types and shadows of the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. And in Genesis 21, we see in verse 17, it says, And God heard the lad crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Then we see also the angel in his presence, or the angel of his presence. Clearly, we see it again in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah in chapter 63 in verse 9, he says this, In all the affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy he redeemed them, and he lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Again, we see another reference, the messenger of the covenant the messenger of the covenant. We see it in the book of Matthew in the New Testament in chapter 3, verse 1. The messenger of the covenant, it says this. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of the Judea, saying thus and thus. This is what we would call the messenger of the covenant. Right? It appeared to individuals. When we get a closer look, at the context of his appearances, it reveals that he is more than another angel. In fact, this is a reference to God, okay? The expression usually signifies a pre, or means a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, all right? Um, and it sometimes, in many places, is called Christophan, uh, uh, um, Christophany, or the Christophanies, okay, types and shadow, meaning the visible and bodily manifestations of God the Son before his incarnation. <clears throat> A lot of people call it the Christophany or types and shadows of, of the person of Christ himself. And we see this replete throughout the Old Testament. And this, be, this is crucial to understand because now you begin to comprehend, okay, that he always has been. Now, how would we begin to illustrate this? Well, simply, that he is not merely another angel is evident in those appearances where he is called God. This was recognized by Hagar. In fact, in fact Hagar does make this recognition because in Genesis chapter 16, in verse 13, it says this, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees. For, she said, have I remained alive here after seeing him? She was stunned that she had an encounter and did not die. We also see Abraham as well. In Genesis chapter 22, it says in verse 14, Abraham called the name of the Lord the place the Lord God will provoke. As it is to, that is to say, that is to say to this day, he said this, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. So the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide here, and we can clearly see this. To Moses in Exodus 3.14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the son of Israel, I am has sent me to you. We see in Judges, <clears throat> okay, 6.22, you remember Gideon. He says in Judges, he says, when Gideon saw, and Gideon, and it says in Judges 6.22, he says, and when Gideon saw that the angel, saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, Lord, O God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. 
uh, we see in the same book of Judges in chapter 13, Manoah. Manoah had this encounter. Look at this in the verse in Judges 13, 18, it says, But the angel of the Lord said to me, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? He has this encounter with him. Later on, <clears throat> in verse 22, same chapter, it says, So Manoah said to his wife, We will surely die, for we have seen God. A clear recognition that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. The expression is also used of men, but on such occasion, it is translated the Lord's messenger. Rarely do you ever see it capitalized or the angel of the Lord applied to men. But when you see the term angels of the Lord, okay, do you see it in, usually as the messenger or the Lord's messenger? For example, if you go to Haggai, Haggai chapter 1 verse 13 says, and Haggai, the messenger of the Lord. Other translations would say, the angel of the Lord spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. So we see this. So make learn to make the distinction, please, as to how the word is being used here. And so the basic application to this would be a simple one. The angel of the Lord no longer appears to men today since God has commissioned Christians to be his messengers to the world. We are now his messengers. Why? Because now we have the Lagas, okay, which is Christ in written form, in his word. And now we, God has chosen because he gives us a commandment. Remember in Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission, that we become the messengers to take his message forward. Okay? So you need to comprehend that. Then let's look at number nine, the sub-doctrine of the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord. In the book of Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 52 says this in verse 13. He says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and, and greatly exalted. He says, My servant will prosper. When we look at this concept of the servant of the Lord, okay, Isaiah prophetically uses the title servant to designate Christ. This is the word that he uses to designate Christ, especially concerning his suffering for sin. The suffering is identified as both vicarious and victorious. Well, first of all, it's vicarious, okay? Look at this in Isaiah chapter 53, <clears throat> verses 4 through 9. This subdoctrine, about when we talk about the servant of the Lord, there is a vicarious experience and there's a victorious experience. I want you to see both of these things. In Isaiah chapter, <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 53, he says in verses 4 through 9, he says the following. Surely our griefs he himself bore, he, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. So he's talking about that we are spiritually healed, right? This is not talking about a physical healing. This is talking about <clears throat> that we are saved, we are healed. And he says, and all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, he says, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom he, the stroke was due. Look what he says. He, his grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was with the rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now, this is a vicarious, okay, <clears throat> uh, prophecy here that this is how we die with him. We see this very clearly as the servant of the Lord. Then, at the same time, we see that he becomes victorious. Victorious. As we continue to read in verses 10, 11, and 12, notice it. It says this, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. 
and as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Now you see where we have the victorious experience here. And he says, therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. <clears throat> so here we see that the title, the servant of the Lord, okay, emphasizes Christ's what? His faithful obedience to the Father during his earthly ministry. We see it clearly <clears throat> later on in the book of John, in chapter 5, verse 19. It says this, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them in John 5, 19, Truly, truly, I say to you that the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. In like manner manner. Look at that. Okay? So I want you to see, now, the servant. And when we see the servant passages, and all of these passages that we read, particularly in the book of Isaiah, okay, were some of the key texts that are used in preaching the gospel in the early days of Christianity. You remember, I've said this in the past to you, that the New Testament was not written during the New Testament. Okay, uh, What we see is that they preach what? The Old Testament. That's what they were preaching from. This is the reason why it's very difficult for you to engage in studying the New Testament only and never reading the Old Testament. It doesn't make sense because you're only getting half the story. And I realize that's a simplistic statement. But in essence, that's true. Okay? You don't understand the complexities nor the profundity of what's being said in the New Testament because it comes from the Old Testament if you never read the Old Testament and you never study the Old Testament. Now, we know it because when we look together in the book of Acts, for example, go to the book of Acts and look at chapter 8. In the book of Acts in chapter 8. Now, notice this. It's starting in verse 32 to 35. And now the passage of Scripture which, was, which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer in silence, so he does not open his mouth in humiliation. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? He says, who will relate his, to his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and then said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth and began, and, and beginning from Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Clearly. What was he doing? Preaching out of the Old Testament. Okay? About talking about the servant of the Lord. So how would we apply it? How, what is the illustration to this? Well, in the New Testament, Christians describe themselves as what? As servants of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? This title conveyed their willingness. If you say you're going to be the servant of the Lord, you, this, title, this is what this title conveys, and it conveys their willingness to depend upon and completely obey God. If you're not willing to do that, then you have great difficulty taking on that title, the servant of the Lord. In the book of James, it says this in James 1.1. 1, 1, he says, James, a bond servant, which is the word or the phrase doulos in Greek, D-O-U-L-O-S, or slave, okay? Um, it says, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, he sends his greetings, all right? We see this very, very, very clearly there, all right? Now, how do we apply this? Well, Christians today should also follow the simple example of the suffering servant of the Lord who obeyed the will of God even when it momentarily seemed unjust. Yes, even in those unjust moments, you must be willing to obey. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this. 1 Peter chapter 2, it tells us in verse 21, 22, 23. For you have been called for this purpose, 
since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, who judges righteously. So I want you to see that we are called okay, to that same place if we're going to be called the servants of God. So the basic application is very simple, that we should follow his example. Now we get to the sub-doctrine called Christ in the tabernacle, Christ in the tabernacle. Go back to the Old Testament, this will be number 10. Go to the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 25, and look with me in verse 8. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Remember, God provides the command. They built the temple. <clears throat> they built the tabernacle, okay, so that he may dwell among them. This, in the, let's look at this explanation. The predominant, if I can put it that way, the predominant type of Christ in the Old Testament is what? The tabernacle. That's the predominant picture of Christ. It's the tabernacle. The New Testament authority for recognizing this typological significance is the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Now, Dr. Fleetwood, who also teaches in our seminary and who's made it um, his, one of his life's ambitions is really, he's going through the book of Hebrews in profound detail, in profound detail, verse by verse. And he's been on, he's been doing an overview of the book of Hebrews for many months, for many, that's just the overview before breaking it down into detail to verse by verse. But you do find in the book of Hebrews, and it's a classic example of it, and turn to chapter 9, please. Go with me to chapter 9. And I want you to see with me in the first 24 verses there. It's a lengthy scripture. But I want you to see that this, in fact, is the New Testament authority for recognizing its typological, its typological significance, okay, that the type of the tabernacle is always representing Christ. Hebrews chapter 9. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, and the outer one in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred and the sacred bread that is called the holy place. Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod was budded in the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But now of these things we cannot now speak in detail. And when these things have been so prepared, and the priests were continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship, but in the second only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance." The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. And since they relate only to food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, and this is to say, not of this creation not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained, what? Eternal redemption. <clears throat> for if the blood of goats and the bulls and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling those who have been de defiled, sanctify the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is what? The mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. 
For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it, is, for it is never enforced while one who has made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was, in, was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses and all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying the following, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels in the ministry with blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. Without shedding the blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things of the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place with his hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So we see here that because of the pattern Okay, of the tabernacle was designed by God, this has led some Bible scholars to conclude that even the most minute details of the tabernacle have a, topo a typological significance. And so we see that Christ in the tabernacle, and this is a profound study out of the book of Exodus, you can see it here, you can see it in Leviticus, you can see it here, in particularly in Hebrews, which is really put together really nicely. Okay? And I, I would recommend you uh, <clears throat> signing up for the course in the book of Hebrews with Dr. Gary Fleetwood. <clears throat> now, how do I illustrate this point? Well, in describing the incarnation, because you recall that in the book of John, it does say in John 1.14, and the word became what? And the word became flesh. And what? And dwelt among us, lived among us among us, and we saw what? We saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here again, we see only begotten in reference to Christ and Christ alone. John uses the word for dwelt, okay, <clears throat> which has the idea of pitching a tent of tabernacle. The tabernacle was a sanctuary that God had described as his dwelling place. Remember that in Exodus chapter 25. Just as God lived in a tent in the wilderness, so the Son of God lived and still lives in a human body as the New Testament tent. So what would be the application? Well, simple. Today, the physical bodies okay, of Christians serve as the temple, the dwelling place of what? Of the Holy Spirit. For he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, verse 20, verse 19 and 20, he says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you whom you have from God, and that you are not of your own? For you have been bought with a price, he says, therefore glorify God in your body. Welcome back. This is Lecture 6, Part 4. Let's continue talking about the doctrine of Christ. Up until this particular point in time, we've had very brief conversation. Remember, this is an overview. We've looked at the deity of Christ. We looked at the humanity of Christ. We looked at the Son of God. We looked at eternal generation. We've looked at the only begotten. We've looked at the I am, the Lagos. We've looked at the angel of the Lord, the servant of the Lord. And we looked at Christ in the tabernacles. We get to number 11 of the sub-doctrine of the doctrine of Christ, which is Christ our Passover. Christ our Passover. Go back with me to the book of Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And we'll look at a brief verse there, verse 13. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. We know the passage very well. Okay? Now, the annual feast of the Passover commemorated what? The birth of the nation of Israel and her deliverance from Egypt. That's what the Passover is about. Okay? It's the birth. Okay? 
It is the birth of the nation of Israel, remember that, and the deliverance of Egypt. It comes out of Egypt, and Israel is born. What is the day of Pentecost for us? It is what? The birth of the church, okay? So Pentecost is what we celebrate, what the Old Testament celebrates as Passover. Now, typologically, it pointed forward to the greater deliverance from the bondage of sin to be provided by whom? By the Messiah. In the Passover, a lamb without blemish was selected and killed. The blood was then applied to the doorpost or door jams, I remember that, of the home, and the lamb and the lamb was roasted and eaten with unleavened bread, bread and bitter herbs. Why? Because they were remembering that they were coming out of Israel, they were in the process of being delivered. So when we understand that, okay, then what, what it, the simplest way and the most, and the most brief, uh, abbreviated way of explaining it, okay, or illustrating it, rather, is that when John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the nation, he recognized Christ as the fulfillment of the typical Passover lamb. This is what he called them, okay? Look at it. In John, remember in John chapter 1, verse 22? I mean, oh, actually, ver John verse 29. John 1, 29 says this. The next day, he saw Jesus coming in, coming to him and said this, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay? So when we see Christ is our Passover, clearly, we can see this very clearly. Okay? <clears throat> so how will we apply this, this, this doctrine in lives? Well, Christians not only recognize the typological fulfillment of this Passover sacrifice by Christ, but also his own responsibility to keep the feast, how? By living a sincere and truthful life. Now, you have to remember that, that, that we actually had this, you know, there's the sovereignty of God, there's human responsibility, okay? uh, God's grace is poured upon man, but man has a responsibility to live up to that, okay? And, and we see this, in, for example, 1 John chapter 5, I mean, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, verse, five, uh, verse 6, 7, and 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, 7, and 8 says this, your boasting is not good. <clears throat> Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, if in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has also been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And truth. So when you hear this concept of Christ, our Passover, this is what we're talking about in brief. Hmm? Then we talk about Christ in the sacrifices. Number 12, Christ in the sacrifices. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 1, note with me in, Levi in Leviticus chapter 1, what is he talking about when he says Christ in the sacrifices? We hear this a lot. Preachers are talking about it, and somebody coming for the first time into, into a sermon or coming into a classroom, and they go, or into a Bible study, and go, what is that about? <clears throat> well, in Leviticus chapter 1, it says, the Word of God says this in verse 2. He says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, he says, when any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. Let's give a very brief explanation about the sacrifices, okay? There's basically four very brief explanations, right? The sacrifice of Christ on Calvary's is a typologically, okay, portrayed in the five major sacrifices of the Old Testament, okay? And um, we see this, and I want you to see this with me. All we know in the New Testament is that Christ dies on the cross. Okay? And somehow we don't connect what the Old Testament talks about. It's the typological representation and the fulfillment of all of these other sacrifices that were involved heavily in Judaism. Mm -hmm. 
So we see this as, number one, there was what was called the whole burnt offering. The whole burnt offering. It, what was it? It emphasizes Christ's offering of himself without spot to God in complete obedience to what? To the will of God. To the will of God. That's the basic representation of that. Number two, the meal offering. The meal offering. Meat in the archaic sense. Okay? In other words, food. Okay? It, it emphasizes the balance, okay, the fragrance and the purity of the life which was offered. Mm -hmm. Number three, the peace offering. It emphasizes the reconciliation or the reconciliation that was accomplished on the cross. So there's a peace offering, okay? And then four and five is that there is a sin and a trespass offering. Which emphasizes, which emphasizes the atoning nature of Christ's sacrifice, saving men from all sin, past, present, and future. Okay? So you need to comprehend that this is Christ in the sacrifices. This is the reason why we study the Old Testament, to really understand okay, what, it, what Christ did in the New Testament for us. So the basic simple application to this is simple. As we think of the complete sacrifice of Christ for our sin today, we are reminded of our responsibility to give ourselves as living sacrifices to God, as living sacrifices to God. I want you to see the atonement. There's much discussion about the atonement. Okay? Again, remain in the Old Testament with me. Go to Leviticus chapter 16. And look at me in Leviticus 16, 16. Uh, I want you to see this with me. In brief, we're going to talk about the atonement. The atonement, all right? Uh, because theologians use this word all the time, okay? And what they're doing is that they're summarizing Christ's work on the cross. That's, a, that's how they're using it many times, right? But in Leviticus chapter 16, 16, when we talk about the atonement, right? He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in the regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. Well, <clears throat> when we look at that, here's a basic explanation. Though the theologians tend to use the term atonement to summarize Christ's work on the cross, it occurs only in the Old Testament. That's it. In fact, in Romans 5.11, okay, is better translated reconciliation, okay, and only relates to the one part of what was accomplished for us, that is to cover our sins, okay. In, we see it in Romans 5.11, okay, very clearly, right, and, and we can see it there because that's, what, that's really what it's talking about. In fact, if you go to Romans 5.11, because we see this term, used, and it says, <clears throat> and not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received, what? Reconciliation. We see this in verse 11, okay? This is, and what it's talking about, this is talking about between the sinners, us, and God. That's what it's talking about here, okay? So, we see it as the word, the atonement, as reconciliation, right? Now, so what is that? Basically, it covers the sin, okay? Now, this word probably means cover, all right? And, and, and it means cover, and is first used when Noah is commanded to cover the ark with a pitch. This is the first time we see, we see this, this concept or how this word is applied. It means to cover, right? Now, you remember that in, back in, in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, uh, go to Genesis 6.14, 6.14. We're talking about the atonement. We're talking about how this word is used only. Okay? Now, in Genesis 6.14, it says, Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms, and you shall cover it inside and out with what? With pitch. With pitch. Okay? So there's this substance that is put on it, okay? And it covers it completely. So that's basically what the atonement meant. It meant to cover the sin. To cover the sin. How will we best illustrate this? Well, 
Just as the ark was a type of Christ in saving his people from judgment, because we know that to be true, because Hebrews 11.7 makes that illusion, that, 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 that connection for us. In fact, it says in Hebrews 11.7, he says, For by faith nor being warned of God by God about things not yet seen, because remember where Noah is back then, he says, In reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which, he, which is according to faith. We see that. So, so when we, we're talking about a type, just as the ark is a type of Christ, okay, in saving his people from judgment, our salvation is covered within and without emphasize in the mean without and without emphasizes the means whereby is secured. That is, our sins are covered by what? By the blood of Christ. Just as the ark was covered with this black pitch, okay, uh, it was all covered with it, okay, inside and out to protect the gopher wood, okay. Just, just what allowed this thing to, to go out to sea, okay? Our sins are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. This covering is, uh, this covering of sin is an expression of God's love for mankind. That's basically what it is. Because you go, if you go to the Old Testament again in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs it says in chapter 10, he tells us this in verse 12. He says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. But love covers all transgressions. So the blood of Christ, okay, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That none may perish, right? So that none of us would perish, right? right? But for those who believe, what would happen? They would have eternal life. So we see this very clearly here. This is how you begin to connect all of these Old Testament concepts to the New Testament, how it's expressed in the New Testament. And then how would we illustrate this? Well, rather, how would we apply this? Well, when a Christian hears about another's failings, now we're talking about Christians hearing about other people failing, right? he should both forgive and forget the event. We should be like that pitch. We should be like that blood to cover the failing of someone else. All believers should follow Christ's example and seek to build up the fallen one rather than follow the natural inclination to engage in gossip. No, what is the tendency? See, how, you know, most people run from trouble, okay? What, what, would, what does a typical firefighter do when a fire breaks out? He runs to the fire. When, when there's a shooting, the police officers run to the shooting, okay? In the wartime, in the battlefield, okay, the soldier runs to the battle, okay? You go into the thick of it, all right? Now, when a brother fails, a sister fails, okay, as Christians, we're to go to them, we're to help to cover their failings, okay? The same way, you don't run from it, you run to it, and that's what reconciliation is. Reconciliation is not something that we catch up to, it comes to us us. It comes to us. In the book of Proverbs, it says in, in Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 9, he says, he who conceals a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. You see that? He who conceals a transgression seeks love. You come to cover it. There was a moral failing. Brother, you need to repent and you need to ask God for forgiveness here. Okay? But you run to cover this, okay? okay? And what it says here, you, because he says, he who covers, uh, conceals the transgression, seeks love. You seek the love of the Father in the life of that person. Okay? And this is one of, the, this is really crucial for us to understand in how we apply, okay, the atonement in a very practical way in our Christian walk. Now let's talk about the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. Stay with me in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30. Now in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30, this is what we're told. It says, For it, for it is on this day that, that atonement shall be made, that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you, and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord before the Lord. So let's explain a little bit. What is this, the Day of Atonement? Well, more than half of the occurrences of the word atonement in Scripture are found in Leviticus chapter 16 alone. 
So about 50% of all the time that you see, okay, when you see this, this concept or the word atonement, is found in Leviticus chapter 16 alone, which describes the most important day on the Hebrew calendar, or we know it today as Yom Kippur. Okay, that's how we know it as Yom Kippur. That's how we know it today, all right? Which is what? The Day of Atonement. This annual holy day celebrated the covering of the national sins by the offering of two goats to God. And one killed and the other driven into the wilderness. In the ceremony, the priest entered the Holy of Holies to present the blood of the slain goat to God. When he came out, the nation knew their sins had been covered for another year. Christ fulfilled this type in that he offered his own blood to God. That's what Hebrews talks about. So Christ is, okay, in the Day of Atonement, he becomes our, well, we remember the term scapegoat, okay? And so we see this very, very clearly here. Um, in the book of Hebrews, he says in verse, in chapter 9, verse 14, he said, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offering himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. Listen, as we look at the illustration of this, this, the type of priest returning from the holy place to those, to those whose sins were covered will be fulfilled when Christ returns for those who have been redeemed by his blood. Personal application. For the Christian, for the Christian, this is a blessed and purifying hope. Okay. Uh, we're told, we're told very clearly here in 1 John 3, 3, it says, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Amen? Now let's look at Christ in the feast of Israel. Christ in the feast of Israel. That's quite a number of feasts that are involved here. Okay? So I want you to see this with me real quickly here. And we'll run through these real quick. And I want you to see this. Now, in Leviticus, again, stay in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2. Do you see the importance why the Old Testament is very crucial for us to understand in the New Testament? Okay. Uh, so we look at the number 15, Christ in the Feast of Israel. Christ, in Leviticus 23, two, verse, uh, verse 2 says this, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as, as holy convocations, my appointment times, my appointment times are these. My appointed times are these. Well, there are seven feasts that we know. There are, there are seven, seven feasts, okay, of holy convocations, okay, listed in this chapter, find their typological fulfillment in Christ. It's all found in Christ. The first four feasts are already fulfilled, and the latter three will be fulfilled at the coming of Christ. So we know out of the seven major feasts that are celebrated, the first four have been fulfilled. There are three more, but those won't be fulfilled until the coming of Christ. Number one, the Passover speaks of our redemption. Okay? That speaks of our redemption, which was, which was accomplished on the cross. That Passover feast, okay, we see it in 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 18 and 19, right? Where he says, And knowing that you were not redeemed by perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, he says, But with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Okay? And then that's followed by the feast of the unleavened bread. Okay? That feast is called the typical, right? And I want you to see that. It's typical of our, what we call our justification. We could clearly see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where it says, where he says, he made him who knew no sin to be for sin on our behalf, so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. Then we also see uh, sanctification. We see that in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, where he says, uh, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. He says, for Christ our Passover has also been what? Sacrificed, right? Uh, also accomplished by Christ on the cross. And then the Feast of the First Fruits. The Feast of the First Fruits, the third one, was fulfilled on the resurrection of Christ. That feast is fulfilled in what? In the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says, but, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits, okay, of those who are asleep, okay? And then number four, we have Pentecost. Pentecost. 
Pentecost was fulfilled when Christ sent the Holy Spirit to begin the harvest of the church, right? And that's Acts chapter 2. That's Acts chapter 2. All of Acts chapter 2 is really is the fulfillment of Pentecost, this feast that is celebrated okay, today by the church, Pentecost, and what was celebrated back then, okay? This particular feast is being celebrated, and, was, and, and that's the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. We see this very, very, very clearly, okay? Then we have um, number five, the Feast of the Trumpets uh, will be fulfilled at the rapture of the church. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 52, where it says, In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, uh, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and imperishable and will also be changed. We see that very clearly. Uh, we see the first, uh, in fact, First Thessalonians chapter 4, right, with that great famous passage there uh, on the rapture. So that's the Feast of the Trumpets. And then we have the Day of Atonement uh, will be completed seven years later when Christ returns. And that's what the whole prophecy in the book of Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, and Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1 talks about. And then we have the Feast of the tabernacles will find its fulfillment okay, um, in Christ's thousand-year kingdom on earth, and that's what the whole prophecy of Zechariah chapter 14 talks about in verse 6. And what would be the application? All the feasts include a Sabbath, reminding Christians of their rest in Christ, and that's why he says, my yoke is light upon you.